Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where our goal is to make you a better investor in the commodity space. My name is Jesse Day, and before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's episode is brought to you by MoneyMetals.com, the most trusted online bullion dealer and depository in the United States. Use Money Metals for purchasing, selling, or storing physical gold and silver. Hit the link in the description below to learn more and use coupon code Jesse Day to get a $10 discount on your first purchase. And today's guest is an economic forecaster with a notable record of accomplishments, including being involved in the creation of the G5, advising President Reagan, and creating Socrates, the only fully functioning AI system that monitors the entire world economy among Many other accomplishments that are too long to list in this introduction. He is the founder of Armstrong Economics, and today we're going to be discussing current dangers in the global economy and get his thoughts on the commodity sector as well. It's Martin Armstrong. It's an honor to have you on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yes, honored to have you here. And I wanted to start with something you mentioned before we hit record here. You said that many things at the moment hinge on the possibilities of war. Could you expand on that and how that ties into the current state of the global economy? In all honesty, I think um, for my lifetime, I've never witnessed administrations, Europe, US, etc. I mean, nobody's interested in peace at all. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this whole thing with Ukraine has been basically orchestrated from the beginning. Um, you had Merkel supposedly, you know, negotiating with Putin over the, um, the, the whole Minsk agreement. And then they never honored it. And she actually came out. I think, I don't know if she had too much to drink and told the truth or what, but uh, she said, Oh, we never intended to, to, you know, to honor it, it was just to buy time for Ukraine to build an army. So from the very beginning, this has been all about creating a war. Uh, and, you know, it, it's it's quite insane. I mean, sources are now saying that, you know, Britain's uh, lobbying, the, you know, NATO to actually create a no-fly zone <laughs> over uh, Kiev's territories. So in other words, NATO would defend uh, Ukraine against any Russian aircraft, but we're giving Ukraine aircraft to go into Russia. I mean, come on. I mean, I mean, there isn't anything that is remotely peaceful about any of this. And <clears throat> then... You know, and then you have the Middle East. It's, um, I mean, our model picked up the Hamas attack. I mean, just as, as just about everything else, every other crisis or of war, whatever. Um, <clears throat> uh, I had learned back in the 80s, we had a client in the Middle East in Lebanon, one of the major banks there, and they had found a ledger with the Lebanese pound written back to like 1850s. And they asked if we could build a model. And I said, sure, we stuck it in. And, you know, it correlates it with the rest of the world. And I out came and said that their country was going to fall apart in eight days. So I thought something was wrong with the data. And, you know, I told the client, I said, look, there's something's got to be wrong here. Because uh, it says your country is going to fall apart in eight days. And he said very calmly, he says, well, what currency would you recommend? And I thought that was really strange. And eight days later, the Civil War began. Uh, same thing happened with a client. We had a big shipper in Saudi Arabia. And uh, he, he actually called me the day before and says that uh, Iraq was going to start attacking shipping in the Gulf. What do you think gold's going to do? <laughs> you know? Uh, so over the years, I began to, to realize that if somebody's going to, to launch some sort of attack or whatever, you do pick it up in the capital flows. They start moving their money in advance. So they were using our, our model ideas for uh, even 9-11. They started looking for people who bought uh, puts on the airlines, you know, a few days before. Um, so 
you know, all of this, I mean, like the Hamas attack, uh, for people to be moving money and buying, you know, uh, defense stocks a few days before, they knew what was coming. I mean, even Egypt came out and said, hey, you got a thousand people on your border. I hate to tell you they're going to go in. And Israel pretends that it was, you know, uh, a complete shock. Uh, I mean, this has all been orchestrated. Uh, honestly, uh, I think it's, I mean, for 40 years, I've been advising central banks and governments, and I've been warning them. I said, you can't continue to borrow year after year with no intention of paying back. And the excuse I always got was, oh, yeah, but we're different. I said, what's different? They said, oh, we're the government. And I would argue, I said, look, you know, you do realize how governments fall. I said, you, everyone that's ever engaged in such a Ponzi scheme of issuing new debt to pay off the old, uh, it comes crashing down when you can't sell the new debt. You know, and they just kind of look at you with a blank stare and, and ignore you. And uh, so I've been on the opposite you know, side of the table from uh, Klaus Schwab, where he's basically uh, <clears throat> arguing the, the opposite, you know, go to totalitarianism, you know, grab everything and you can retain power. Uh, and I'm saying, I'm sorry, it's just not going to work. Um, so it's it, it seems as though they want this war so they can stage another Brenton Woods too. Uh, and <clears throat> come up with a new currency and default on all their old debts, basically. Uh, and they're not going to default per se on like uh, the domestic debt owed, like to Social Security or something, because then you're going to see, you know, millions of people running down there with pitchforks at the White House. You know, um, what they probably will do is uh, most likely just outright default on any who holds debt outside the country, who is an enemy. Uh, and that's namely China is the largest holder um, of U.S. debt. But I mean, uh, our real problem here is the president of the United States is supposed to have these cabinet meetings and he's supposed to be like the referee between these agencies. And Biden's on vacation 40% of the time. And the rest of the time, he's basically needs somebody to wipe the drool from his face, you know. Um, and so you see this, <clears throat> what's going on. You have all these agencies each pursuing their own agenda and nobody's coordinating anything. Uh, so you have the climate change people attacking the farmers, trying to reduce food. Meanwhile, you've got the neocons and the State Department trying to create war. Uh, and <clears throat> then you have them threatening China over Taiwan and nobody is there in, in between to say, Hey, do you realize if you do that, they're not going to buy our debt. If they don't buy the debt, the whole thing comes crashing down. Um, so that's what I mean. It just seems as though each agency is doing its own thing. Nobody's paying attention to anything. And, um, the risk of war here, um, my sources are basically saying they're trying to escalate it as fast as possible. Um, and, you know, Britain's lobbying with NATO and they even want to send in an expeditionary force into Ukraine. Uh, and they're, they're looking to do this by May. Um, you know, that... The elections in Russia are March, and the, the new president is supposed to be uh, sworn in. His inauguration day is May 7th, and they seem to be targeting this stuff. I mean, Poland, uh, <clears throat> just this weekend, you know, armed all its borders, uh, announced that it's, you know, staging, you know, military uh, actions on its borders. NATO just launched the largest military exercise in the history of of NATO. Um, it's it's like 
just nobody wants peace. Uh, and you have to ask why. What is going on? I mean, do we have the most uh, brain-dead world leaders all at the same time or what? Um, but I, honestly, I've never witnessed this, and I've been dealing with governments for, like I say, over 40 years. Yeah, well, maybe we could pull back the curtain a little bit and get your thoughts on why you think this is all escalating the way it is, because obviously there's been cycles of war and conflict largely driven by political elites for their own agenda or for profits for the military industrial complex, et cetera. There can be a lot of different reasons. You have a ton of experience dealing with governments and government agencies, as you mentioned, and people in power. What what do you think? Do you do you have a theory on on why this has all turned out the way it has? And what is the worst possible outcome? And is there anything that has you optimistic in there? Is there anything you see, even a shred of light, that makes you think this could resolve in in a in a peaceful manner eventually or produce something positive? The answer to that last part is no. Okay. <laughs> Uh, look, I know some of these neocons. Uh, I've known Bill Crystal. It was Bill Crystal's father that even started the whole neocon movement, and they started within the Democrats. All right. So you have to understand this is not a Republican versus Democrat issue. All right. The neocons go wherever they can to, to create war. Um, and like I said, I've, I've been in conversations with them. You know, face to face, and I disagree with their theories. But you know, uh, Bill Crystal even wrote the book on justifying going into Iraq. Uh, and <clears throat> I mean, there they used nine eleven as the excuse, and Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with nine eleven. Um, there was never any weapons of mass destruction. I mean, they lie about everything all the time, anyhow. Um, and <clears throat> Their theory was that if they go in and they remove, remove these dictators in the Middle East and bring democracy, uh, then that will create peace. And it's absurd. I mean, they actually take that same nonsense and apply it to Russia. Oh, Putin's a dictator, blah, 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 all this other kind of stuff. And if we went in there and took out Putin, the, the, the Russian people would celebrate. I mean, no, they're not. I mean, I don't know what they, what, you know, they're smoking down there. But I mean, <clears throat> I was in the middle of all of that when Putin came to power. They were asking me to put in $10 billion into this hermitage capital. And back in 2000, or actually 1999, they were trying to take over Russia. And they were interfering in the Russian election. Um, they got Yeltsin to take $7 billion from the IMF loans. It was wired through a bank in New York into um, Geneva under the pretense of refurbishing the Kremlin. <laughs> um then they went to Yeltsin and threatened him that if you don't resign and put in their puppet, who was Boris you know, Barisnovsky, that all this was going to come out. And so Yeltsin did resign, but he turned to Putin. Why? Um, because Putin was an oligarch, but he also was not one of these hardline communists. All right. Um, they go, oh, he was KGB. He was a lower level KGB guy who quit as soon as 1991 came. All right. I mean, this is all propaganda. Yeltsin turned to Putin because he was not one of either side. And the hardliners had actually filed a motion to impeachment against Yeltsin. So they were trying to take the country back to the USSR. And um, so that's why Putin ended up with such a huge popularity because it was kind of seen like maybe like Trump and it went, you know, not neither real party sort of thing. Um, and they realized that without Putin, they would have went back to communism or the oligarchs would have taken over. And, you know, neither one solution would have been very good either. Uh, I mean, Barisnovsky, when I refused to, to fund this project, um, you know, he even called me to, to try and convince me otherwise. I mean, that's why, and, 
you know, I've got all the declassified documents from the Clinton administration of that period. Uh, <clears throat> they had even uh, proposed that Russia join NATO. Um, and that's why there was a coup against uh, Gorbachev to begin with. And Yeltsin had to stand on the tank and all that kind of stuff because the hardliners thought that he was going to join NATO. And that would be a surrender uh, to the United States. So that's why there was a coup and all this stuff. With you know, they want to keep this out of the history books. But uh, I, I've got the declassified documents, and it shows clearly what what they were doing. And that's why Hillary uh, blamed Putin for interfering in the 2016 election because they were interfering in the Russian election in 2000. All right, so. This has been a real mess for a long time. Uh, and when I was told from the bankers that, we, oh, let's get involved. Russia is probably the richest nation on the face of the earth from a natural resource perspective. They've got, you know, energy, platinum, diamonds, gold, you name it. Um, Russia actually had the largest gold reserves of any nation on earth in 1917. Uh, when the communist revolution was coming, uh, they hid the reserves and nobody's found them ever since. Um, so uh, this is this tension has always been back and forth and it's, it's debatable what all their theories are. Uh, but I think when uh, Khrushchev said, we will bury you and spread communism to the world, I think that's when these people got their backs up. Oh, yeah, well, we're going to show you we're going to spread democracy to the world because their version of democracy is not democracy at all. It's still a totalitarian thing. We're not asked to vote on anything. Um, we don't vote on our taxes going up. We don't vote get to vote if you can go to war. Uh, and just look at Vietnam. You were 18. You were old enough to die and get drafted. You weren't old enough to vote or even have a drink. <laughs> but you... You could vote, you know, you, you know, here's a gun, go kill, you know, go kill some people for us. Um, so it, but that's why Hillary was blaming, you know, Putin all along. And, and it's because nobody wants to tell the truth. But I mean, I was in the middle of all that stuff. So I know absolutely personally what took place. And plus, I got the declassified documents finally out of the Clinton administration. But um, so we're, we're looking at, just uh, it's hard to say, but uh, how much some people looking at it from a uh, wealth perspective, uh, others or the neocons, they could care less about the economy. It's more about, I think that they're just angry that communism fell and they didn't get to shoot anybody. Uh, so they're still just angry at, at, at China and, and, uh, and Russia. Uh, I mean, I even, people had just been brainwashed. I mean, I was talking to one congressman and he said, oh, well, you know, it's the Communist Party in China. I said, they're not communist. Oh, how can you say that? I said, you understand what communism means. The government owns everything. How many billionaires does China have? <laughs> All right. I said, they just didn't change the name because that would force them to take Mao's picture down and say he was wrong, you know. <laughs> So they just kept the name, but they're not communists. Come on. If they were communism, there's no private ownership in communism. Totalitarianism, authoritarianism, fine. But, um, you know, communism is a completely different thing. That's what, you know, Klaus Schwab is pushing, you know, you own nothing and be happy. Um, but so I, I don't know. I, I think <clears throat> the neocons are in charge uh, because we have probably the weakest president in, in history. Uh, you had the queen of the neocons there is um, Victoria Newland, And she was in every administration, Republic or Democrat, didn't matter, uh, until Trump. Uh, Trump fired the neocons. So that's why her husband came out and started this nonsense with an op-ed in the Washington Post. Oh, Trump's going to be a dictator. Why? Because he fired her, his wife and him um, uh, and, and John Bolton, who's uh, another neocon. I think he would invade Canada to get three Russians. I mean, it, this, these people are just hateful. 
Um, if you or I did that against anybody in, in society, we'd be arrested for hate speech, you know, um, and discrimination, you know, whatever. But uh, so these people just want war. And, and unfortunately, I think they're getting it because they got the that's why they want to keep uh, Biden, because they can do whatever they want. Uh, there's nobody there reining them in. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> you have to understand Washington. Uh, I was there when Reagan was elected. And it was the first time I heard it, they were beside themselves. Oh, my God. I said, what's the problem? And they said, oh, you don't understand. I said, what don't I understand? Oh, he's a governor. We're going to have to train him. They don't like anybody from outside of Washington. So you look at Camilla, she's from the Senate. You look at Pence, who they stuck in there with um, uh, <clears throat> Trump, also from, uh, from Washington. I mean, you have to be part of their club. And there really is a uniparty. I mean, um, I mean, it just, I mean, look at this nonsense. I mean, Trump wanted to build a wall to protect our border. Oh, that's outrageous. $1.2 billion it's going to cost to wasteful money. What are they giving uh, Ukraine? $118 billion. Um, you know, it's, it, this is just nonsense. It's complete nonsense. Um, and even with the border uh, <clears throat> conflict, uh, I will say this. I had the mandate from Hong Kong they knew I knew the Australian government and asked me to negotiate on their behalf. I met with Paul Keating, who was a you know, former prime minister down there. And everything I proposed to buy an island, no. Uh, how about letting uh, let us take some of the upper left-hand corner of Australia where nobody's at, no. Uh, I finally got so frustrated. I said, look, I've got a blank check here. I can pay off your national debt. And I said, what's the problem? I said, is this racist? And he said to me, no. He says, they are fleeing communism. And if they allowed them to go into Australia, they would vote conservative. And he was a labor government. And I was completely shocked. Uh, but, he, you know, look, he told me the truth. That was it. It's politics. And that's what's going on with this border. They think letting in all these people, they're going to change the politics of the United States. And the Democrats are finally going to win. And we're going to have a uh, complete suppression of every of, of civil rights, taxes, you name it. Um, it's the same scenario. Uh, it's the same thing going on in Europe. Um, they think they can change the uh, political situation so they retain power forever. Uh, I mean, it's it's disgusting, but uh, this is really what's going on. Fascinating. I want to shift to gold and silver for a moment. And how many of the problems going on geopolitically, economically, are at all related to the fact that we're on a fiat currency system? Um, you know, a lot of people point to gold being removed from backing the dollar in 71 and that causing a cascade of uh, negative consequences from that point forward. Do you ascribe to that theory and how much do you think transacting, bringing somehow bringing gold back into the monetary system could fix things? You know, there's the gold bug dream out there that if we just bring back sound money, it's going to fix everything. Um, is that real or is that just a pipe dream? That's a pipe dream. Uh, what you have to understand is it's not the money. It's the politics. <clears throat> All right. You would have to change the entire political system. Right? It doesn't matter what money is, I, in all honesty. Um, <clears throat> you can't have this. It's ever since we moved towards this Marxist socialistic agenda. Then it's vote for me and I'll give you X, Y, Z. You can't do that under a fixed exchange rate system. All right. And it's not, uh, you know, just the reason Brenton Woods collapsed was because of that. All right. You fix gold at $35, fine. But you did not, you know, fix the amount of money you, you print. 
Um, so you keep expanding the money supply, but the ratio is still at $35. Obviously, I think a three-year-old with a pocket calculator could figure out that this is going to go bust. Right? Um, <clears throat> and then you have a lot of people who just blame the central bank. And they have no concept that the central bank and what it prints is such a tiny fraction of everything. The real culprit is Congress. All right. Um, <clears throat> before, you know, the collapse of Brenton Woods, uh, if you took a government e-bond, you went down to the bank and you said, gee, I want to borrow money on this. It was illegal. So that's where the theory of it's less inflationary to borrow than to print. So, <clears throat> but that changed with the collapse of Brenton Woods. If you want to trade gold futures, you can post T-bills as collateral. So government debt is now just money that pays interest. So the Federal Reserve, uh, <clears throat> you know, they get bashed all the time wrongly. All right, because, you know, Powell just came out at the beginning of December. And most people don't pay attention too much. What he said was, this spending is unsustainable. And <clears throat> I've been dealing with central banks for decades. And I can tell you, it's, a, it's kind of a club in the sense that, one, they will never criticize their host government. And two, they do not criticize each other. All right. <clears throat> For Powell to come out and say that the spending is unsustainable. The last time the Federal Reserve broke with the White House was 1951 when it refused to keep, you know, quantitative easing going for the Korean War. And <clears throat> so for Powell to come out and say that at the beginning of December last year, it shows you the pressure that's building. And it's not the Fed. The Fed cannot control Congress, what they're spending. I mean, we're now looking at, at deficits nearly $2 trillion for a single year. Interest payments at a trillion. When Ronald Reagan came to power, people were freaking out because the national debt hit a trillion. <laughs> All right. I mean, we are so far beyond that. Uh, it, it's, it's crazy. So... <clears throat> It's just the, uh, it's not really fiat currency or anything of this. It's, it's complete um, irresponsibility from the government side. I mean, they are just, you know, out of it. Uh, and they spend whatever they want to spend when they want to spend it. And they do not look at any fiscal restraint or management. Uh, when the Federal Reserve comes out and says, okay, fine, we want to stop inflation, we're going to raise interest rates. Do, does Congress say, oh, gee, they want us to spend less, so we'll reduce our spending? I mean, never. Um, so it, it, we have to understand there's a separation between church and state here. And stop blaming the Fed all the time and start looking at the real source of the problem. That's our politics. And I mean, like handing $118 billion to Ukraine on the weekend. I mean, come on. Um, you know, it, this is just, it, it's going to end in complete disaster. Um, and it, what we're looking at here is probably most of your reader, you know, your listeners, they understand about gold. All right. <clears throat> the average person does not. And you have a younger generation never even heard of, of Brenton Woods. All right. So the question really is, when do we upset their confidence? Okay. Something's got to happen for that to take place. That's most likely the war. All right. When they start realizing they're going to get drafted, what, what's going on here? Um, that's when you're starting to look at something a little bit different. And gold does not respond to inflation. It responds to geopolitical stuff. I mean, it went from 100 to $400 between 76 and 79. In the last six weeks, it went from 400 to 875. Why? 
That's when Russia invaded Afghanistan. So it's geopolitical that you have to pay attention to. And uh, with these people trying to create war, that's when gold rises. All right. Because at that point in time, when people start looking at what I'm saying here, Powell cannot stop um, inflation. Inflation from war. It was Vietnam that broke Bretton Woods. So creating war because these neocons, oh, we got to do this. They do not understand what that will do to the economy uh, at all, to interest rates. Um, they're too stupid to realize you you threaten China and China stops buying um, U.S. debt. Guess what? Interest rates rise. They don't go down. Um, you know, nobody's connecting the dots here. Uh, that's that's the real, real problem. So gold will take off, yes, but it's not when, you know, uh, it's when that average person that's never bought gold, never heard of gold, because uh, we've got another generation that's grown up since 1971. They never knew about a fixed exchange rate or anything of, na- of the nature. Um, when you shake their their tree, and they lose the confidence. That's when you're going to start seeing the assets moving from government to private. Now, the smart money is already doing that. That's why the stock market's moved up. Real estate, people have been trying to get money off the grid. I mean, I live in Florida. I still get three calls a week, at least. You want to sell your house? No, I don't. Thank you. Where am I going to go? Chicago? You know, <laughs> um, so it, you have a lot of smart money trying to just get money out of the banks. You got CBDCs coming. Uh, so the confidence in government is, is declining rapidly. And I think the war will probably be that, that straw that breaks the, the camel's back. Well, let's shift to CBDCs then. And just in general, how the average person out there can protect their wealth from you know this massive debt crisis from a potential collapse of the economy. Obviously, you mentioned you think gold's going to go higher. Do you think it's smart to have your hands on some gold bullion? Um, Wondering what your thoughts are on silver. And also, yeah, let's let's start with that and then then we'll go to CBDCs. Well, I would say, look, for silver, you have to judge it by... um, that generation, you know, X or Z or whatever they want to call them now, it was never even seen that. Okay. So it, it, there are videos on YouTube showing somebody offered a chocolate bar and a silver bar and they take the chocolate. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so they will need something to be able to identify. All right. And that is most likely the old silver coins, which you can buy. All right, so they can look at that. Oh, yeah, okay, fine. 1964 and back, I know is good. All right, that's what you're going to look at. You got to deal with the idiot level, all right? Um, And um, so most of your assets, people are moving um, away from government. And not just here, we're looking at even in Europe, uh, the latest study in Europe shows that confidence in the European government is down to 30 percent. Uh, it's um, people are just getting fed up uh, in Europe. They've been pushing the climate change very aggressively and and people are realizing they're losing jobs. They're the the cost of living is just rising dramatically. Um, you know, so these things are, are starting to come, you know, to the forefront, I would say. So you have to understand that I would say that uh, you're looking at anything that's pretty much tangible. So you see rare coins going up, rare stamps going up like crazy, um, antique cars. uh, You know, everybody's got something a little bit different, but um, effectively you're looking at that shift from public to private. And the amount of money in government bonds versus like equities is like 10 to one. So it doesn't take that much to make the stock market take off dramatically, things of this nature. And 
you have to look at um, real history. <clears throat> All right, take the the German hyperinflation. Uh, back then, it was a little different in the sense that it was just Germany going through this because it. Um, I mean, you had other Eastern countries, Hungary, etc., also, but. Uh, <clears throat> It was mainly because of uh, reparation payments and things of this nature. So people were moving their, their capital uh, and keeping it in foreign currency. We don't have that option this time. All right, because they're all in the same boat. Uh, and these people that keep bashing the United States, all the debt level, they don't look outside this country. The U.S. is actually in the best shape. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, take a look at Europe. It's, it's a real basket case. Uh, and uh, Japan is, you know, is, with its negative interest rates, they're still in trouble. All right. Um, U.S. is, uh, the reason U.S. currency is the reserve currency is not because of fiat or anything of that nature. It's because the U.S. has the largest consumer-based economy in the world. That means Germany needs to build their BMWs and Mercedes and sell them here. All right. <clears throat> Japan was building Toyotas to sell them here. All right. Is <clears throat> those countries, if you look at Germany, they use the old mercantile exchange idea. We build things and sell them to everybody else. So they keep their taxes high. Um, the average net worth of a German is less than an Italian because they try to keep it oppressed, afraid of inflation. Um, that's mainly because they misunderstand the whole hyperinflation period. They think, oh, that's because you printed money. And no, it was not. Um, in 1922, in December, to make they could not make the reparation payments, so they confiscated 10% of everybody's wealth and issued bonds for it. Once they did that, that's what started the hyperinflation in 23. So then the government printing money was the response because people were withholding cash, took money out of the banks, moved it into foreign currencies and tangible assets. So all your rare German coins and stamps ended up actually in America. And they started going back the other way after World War II. Um, land. Uh, in fact, when they finally came out with a new currency in 1925, it was backed by land. Uh, it wasn't backed by, by gold. They didn't even have gold left. All right. So uh, <clears throat> our lessons from that in Zimbabwe, etc. I mean, people resorted to using other currencies, but we don't have that. OK, so what's our choice? Our choice is basically anything that's tangible. Um, that's why real estate you know, goes up. Um, you have um, rare coins, stamps, autographs, uh, antique cars. All these things have been going up quite sharply. Um, <clears throat> and also the stock market. And you... <clears throat> So in the end, the stock market will go up with gold. All right. Pay attention to the three indexes. NASDAQ is a retail index. Um, S&P 500 tends to be more domestic institutional. The Dow tends to be the international um, blue chip. So like when the Japanese came here and they were buying all the real estate up in the 80s, uh, what were they buying? Rockefeller Center. They buy the trophies. All right. So big institutional cash outside the country buy the Dow. And if you plot all three together, you'll see the Dow led the market all the way up. That was showing you was foreign capital coming in. Um, they need to pick up the phone and say, okay, fine, buy me uh, 500 million of this one. They don't buy the, the IPOs and, and out of NASDAQ, you know. Um, 
And also when you're dealing at that level of major institutional investors, um, <clears throat> they're not going to buy some startup thing and put in a ton of money because if they're wrong, they lose their job. All right. It's better off that they stick with the blue chips for the bulk of the money. Um, and that way, if they lost, hey, everybody else lost so they don't get fired. Uh, that's really the way the big money operates institutionally. Uh, it, it's also why, you know, um, we're the biggest institutional advisors around. We've got offices in China and everywhere because we've been around for a long time. Everybody else uses us, so that's good cover for them. That's simply the way it goes. I mean, you've, you've got a model and says, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Look at this. And if he tries it and loses, done. There's his whole career. So they're not going to buy something or even attempt something on something that that somebody just made up. Um, you know, you have to look at institutional big money, and that's really the way it goes. Um, we, we actually get requests for um, some of the biggest, you know, top five in the, in the world. Actually asked us, gee, can you create a, a portfolio of, these green stocks that we just break even on. Uh, so because politically they had to have some, but if you invest in green, you lose money, you know? Uh, so they said, can you work out something that we at least break even? <laughs> and that's just to satisfy political requirements. That's it. Uh, so these are the kind of requests that we get. It, it's much Different than, oh, gee, you know, I made 5% with this guy and rather 6% with this one. That, it's not, that doesn't work um, at that level. You're, you're looking at something much more different. And do you have any thoughts or are you seeing any opportunity in the commodities sector at the moment or related equities, oil and gas producers, uh, related stocks, uranium, base metals? Is there any of those sectors or, or any other commodities that you're looking at the moment that you think could present opportunity? When you start getting into war, um, yes, you, you nickel, copper, things of this nature tend to go up. Uh, you need them um, <clears throat> to build weapons or, or whatever. Even during uh, World War II, they took nickel. Uh, you can buy what they, they call them the war nickels. They're made up almost pure silver um, because nickel was worth more than the silver at the time. Um, uh, so uh, you're going to see that sort of thing take place. Um, as far as the, the climate change nonsense, um, I mean, these people are, uh, they haven't done their homework at all, like throwing our, you know, carrot soup on the Mona Lisa because it's an oil painting. I'm sorry, that's not crude oil, it was linseed oil, you know. <laughs> Um, I mean, they don't even know, understand these things. I mean, they, you know, but um, <clears throat> there is absolutely no way possible to ever replace uh, fossil fuels with uh, solar panels or anything else. I mean, I mean, it would be a real joke to, to start reproduce tanks that, that run on uh a solar panel while they're trying to find something to plug into while the, you know, the, the Russians are plowing through them because they got diesel, you know, um, it's just a joke. I mean, how do you get us one flying around in a, in a, in a jet without, you know, without fuel? Um, I mean, these people don't really look at a lot of this stuff. I mean, uh, fossil fuels are the, where plastic comes from. Um, you know, Vaseline jelly, you know, I mean, come on, there's so much that these people just don't know about. And if you, you simply look at the cycles of climate, uh, we've gone through, you know, ice ages and booms and heat periods, uh, and it's got nothing to do with fossil fuels. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, these people like blaming the industrial revolution. I hate to tell them, but we were in the mini ice age. Okay, uh, in the 1700s, even John Adams wrote a letter that the ground was frozen two feet deep. They couldn't even plant anything. Um, you know, so this is just part of nature. I mean, you know, we've been had ice ages. 
you know, and without moms who were driving around in SUVs to pick up the kids, you know, um, to get it warm again. I mean, it, it's, um, <clears throat> I moved to Florida seven years ago to get closer to global warming. It was getting a little too cold up there. Do, do you think at this point in time then that fossil fuels present any sort of opportunity as sort of a contrarian play to this global elite ESG agenda they're pushing? Because it's a sector that's been massively underinvested in and a sector that is also hated. Um, and a lot of these equities are trading at attractive valuations. Do you think that could be a sector where investors might be able to find value? Yes. And I think... Again, once the war starts, then you're going to see you need fossil fuels. Right. Um, and uh, all this, you know, nonsense. Uh, I mean, these people out there trying to stop farmers. Um, do you realize it's, it is getting colder? The, the, we're in solar minimum or maximum at this point, And um, the temperature has been declining. It's just a natural cycle. I mean, this is one of the coldest winters uh, in a long time. And then they go, oh, that's because of climate change. No, it's not. It's just a natural cycle. Sorry. Um, but, you know, they don't want to admit they're wrong. It's the same thing with the neocons. You know, they just keep calling China communist. You know, it's, you know, uh, what are we fighting for? It was to bring democracy and, and capitalism to the world. Well, we succeeded in bringing capitalism, but they don't want to admit that. Well, let's end on central bank digital currencies. How close are these to potentially getting rolled out? Um, how many countries are currently working on these things? Could this become a global phenomenon? To me, it feels like it's a pretty tough sell um, in certain countries, at least. You know, I live in the Balkans. I live in Serbia. In this part of the world, it'd be a pretty tough sell to tell people to use a CBDC. But in Canada, it would be easy. I, I think it would be simple. But where I'm from, um, people will just eat up whatever government propaganda gets pushed their way and, and download their, their new CBDC in their digital wallet. So how, how much of a threat is this? How close is it to getting rolled out? How do you see this whole thing developing? They're actually... In the United States, and, and Europe may follow the United States, not Serbia or, the, or Eastern Europe. Um, and you, you have to understand, when Ukraine blew up uh, Nord Stream, uh, which I think is all out now, but uh, <clears throat> the neocons promised, if Germany just kept its mouth shut, that what they would do would build a pipeline from Nigeria to replace Russia. And <clears throat> so the U.S. taxpayer was paying for this. And the part of the deal was that Nigeria was supposed to be the test case for the CBDCs. And you can Google this. They create, they eliminated cash and they, and <clears throat> went to the CBDCs as a test and it turned into burning banks and violence. And it was, you know, and the people I talked to in government said, oh, yeah, but the, the reason that happened is because they were 60% cash. We're only maybe 35. Uh, so, I mean, they always try to find an excuse. Um, but they do want to move rapidly because they see this as the people are always the enemy. And what I hear, even Europe, they think by moving to a digital currency, they'll increase their taxes by 35%. Because you, you, know, you wipe out the underground economy, etc. cetera. Um, but there's a problem. And this is what nobody's really talking about yet. Um, the Federal Reserve would not, is not really interested. What they're doing is they're using the COVID model. And by that, what I mean is, is that if you read the U.S. Constitution, look at the First Amendment. It says the government shall not pass any law. All right. <clears throat> People have a misnomer. They think they have a constitutional right to free speech. You do not. It says the government shall not. Okay. So all of a sudden, Facebook, everybody else was in there censoring people, kicking them off platforms. 
you obviously don't have a right to free speech. All right. <clears throat> and it's, it's like the old sales job. You buy uh, accident insurance, fire insurance, all these things. They couldn't sell death insurance. So they changed the name. And they called it life insurance. Oh, great. Yes. I, give me some life insurance. You know? And then people brag how much they got. It's death insurance. All right. So they've done the same thing here. They just flipped the name. So what we're looking at is that <clears throat> COVID was successful in manipulating society. And the government could tell them, we want this person removed, etc. That's okay, because the government didn't do it. Now, <clears throat> you're going to do this with the CBDCs. The Federal Reserve is not going to create one. The top five banks are all secretly trying to create one for themselves. And then they would be regulated by the Feds. There's already rules and regulations in place. <clears throat> If the bank sees that, uh, you, you know, I sent you a hundred thousand in cash or whatever, boom, that's going to be, you know, redlined. Uh, and then bank will then report, Hey, there's suspicious activity going on. <clears throat> that's what's going to happen because if the federal reserve did the CBDC, it would be illegal for them to in, to investigate you without just cause search warrants, etc. However, the bank can say has a suspicious activity report that are already in place. So if the bank manages the CBDCs, hey, this guy just did something, better take a look at it. Thank you very much. They didn't violate your constitutional rights. It's the same as COVID. So <clears throat> it's possible that Europe will end up following the Fed. But they do want to get these things in ASAP uh, because one of the number one problems that they are going to face is that when you start war there in Europe, what's going to happen is there's going to be capital flow. And <clears throat> I would say outflows. Uh, the U.S. was bankrupt in 1896. That's when J.P. Morgan had to lend $100 million in gold to bail out the country. All right. So... By the end of World War I, the U.S. was the financial capital world. It took it from Britain. By the end of World War II, it ended up with 76% of the world official gold reserves. Why? Because, you know, if you've got tanks running around blowing up banks, you're not going to leave your money there. All right. So everybody, you know, put it on whatever boat they could find and sent their money to the United States. That's what made the U.S. the reserve currency. It was two wars. So you start a war there in the Middle East, in Europe, and Asia. All the money's flowing into the U.S. Uh, I'm already talking to Japanese clients, and you, you, you know, when you have North Korea shooting missile tests off over Japan, they go, "Well, maybe we should have some over there." You're right. All right. Same thing from the Middle East now. Uh, it's just being prudent. So um, I fear that they would push to do the CBDCs uh, as soon as war begins to develop. And they're looking at, you know, trying to start something even as early as May. Um, <clears throat> I would be more cautious about July going into September uh, on a geopolitical level. By then it might mature and you're going to see some craziness at that stage in the game. Uh, but the joke in Washington is, is that the Biden administration has created more billionaires than any administration ever. The problem is they're all in Ukraine. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> you know, it's, I mean, this is what you're, you're going to find. So uh, I think you're going to see the push for CBDCs uh, much sooner than people suspect. Um, and it's going to be mainly to control capital flows. Um, uh, <clears throat> Lagarde already has come out and said, you know, the money has to stay here for investment. So she's already implying they're worried about capital outflows from the EU. But as soon as you start getting these people, 
you know, beating the war drums, money's going to move. Right. Well, Martin, this has been such an amazing conversation. I've learned so much. I truly appreciate you coming on and sharing all your knowledge with us. Uh, for those who want to hear more from you, where's the best place to go? Is it Armstrong Economics? Uh, yes, yeah, so armstrongeconomics.com. Uh, you don't have to put in your email. It's it's open to everybody. It's free. Um, we try to put that out as a public service for the world. Great. Well, I'll put a link to that in the description below so people can check that out. Thank you once again, Martin. It's truly been a pleasure. Well, thank you for inviting me and take care over there. And thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, this episode is sponsored by MoneyMetals.com. Use promo code Jesse Day to get $10 off your first purchase. Link is in the description below, and I'll see you guys in the next episode. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.